Good afternoon. Um, being the last person on a panel is always difficult. Um, also, I want to talk, what I want to talk about today is uh, the universal prevention curriculum. Forgive me, I just had cataract surgery and I have to wear this for reading. <laughs> and it's, it's very strange, so bear with me on that. Um, but I'm going to be talking about the universal prevention curriculum. Um, and we are really the new kid on the block, so to speak, in so many ways compared to treatment. Um, the research in the treatment area goes back to the 1970s and uh, has been quite extensive in, in many ways. However, since uh, the past 30 years, we've been actually doing a great deal in learning more about how to prevent the initiation of drug, of substance use. And I want to talk about, a little bit about that today. Um, sorry. Nope. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, can somebody help me? Um, I can't see anything. I'm like a blind person. I'm really sorry. I can't see the screen. <laughs> oh, it's embarrassing. Yes, I can. Yeah, I can see that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, what has happened, which has been very exciting, in, in 2012, um, 2013, the uh, UNODC had decided to review all the research in prevention to begin looking for evidence-based practices. And it was a very rigorous, a rigorous review um, and a very extensive review. We went through hundreds and hundreds of articles and try to, and we developed some very, uh, as I said, rigorous criteria. We looked at meta-analysis, um, we looked at uh, randomized controlled trials, et cetera. And um, we came up with um, the international standards that we talked about. This afforded us an opportunity, since none of this was done before, this afforded us an opportunity to begin to think, wow, we really learned a lot. Because before that, I'm sure many of you have experienced that, when you talk to policymakers, you talk to community groups, um, you find you, they say, well, you know, prevention really doesn't work. Or, I know how to do prevention. I mean, you just you bring an ex addict in and, and, and you talk about the trials and tribulations and how awful their lives have been and how they've been able to turn it around. And, or we, or we do a media campaign or posters um, because there, nobody understood that there was really a science there a science of prevention. And this science really has been truly new. It's been recently defined by the U.S. Society for Prevention Research in 2011, only a few years ago. And this science is multidisciplinary. And I think that that's been a challenge to us because we bring in data from clinical studies that were, were covered earlier by Dr. Guerra, um, epidemiologic studies, um, psychological studies, health studies, social sciences, um, the, the whole field of, of substance use prevention has been challenging even to st statisticians because of the kinds of research designs we had. And so this, this is also a research, uh, recent development in terms of research designs and in terms of statistical analysis. How do you look at this data? How do you control for uh, c contaminations or confounding results? So this is truly a new field. Mm. Obviously, the basis for uh, our, our prevention should be the etiology of substance use. And etiology um, really draws from understanding of, of many different kinds of studies that look at what, why do some children in some areas who seem to be uh, similar, why are some of them use substances and why do others not? And looking at those characteristics. And also we have this wonderful research that's now evolving that actually I'll be talking a little bit about tomorrow morning, um, how that I think that's gonna impact prevention. Um, most of these studies have um, really started in the 1970s. And a lot of them, are early studies were looking at longitudinal um, groups of children and adolescents are following them 
actually some of these studies now are multiple generations. They're looking at grandchildren of the original um, set of cohort of, of individuals. And also there have been many studies of, of children of substance users, as you're familiar with. And, and then, of course, we have these, these new studies. Um, so what do we knew, know about the initiation of substance use from, from our epidemiologic studies? We learned that substance use begins in late childhood and adolescence and therefore is a developmental problem. And in prevention, we, we begin, to, you'll see, we look, at, um, prevention, we look at the prevention programs in terms of developmental, uh, uh, developmental life course. It's also a process that includes many different pathways and mostly driven by behavioral decisions and influenced by internal, biological, and genetic factors and external uh, environmental and social factors. And this is actually this model that you see before you um, was developed um, as part of the UNODC uh, standards document. And we, we use this, this is the core, one of the core elements of the prevention um, the UPC, the Universal Prevention Curriculum. And what it looks at is, is exactly what we heard earlier. I think, Dr. Gary, you did a wonderful job in setting this up and looking at the importance of looking at the interaction between the personal characteristics or the vulnerability, if you will, of individuals and their micro environments and their macro environments. And these things, these influences drive beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors. In the 1990s, um, two, two uh, influential reviews were done. One was done by, at the University of Washington by David Hawkins and his group, and the other was done by a group of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, Mark Lance and Roy Pickens. And they looked at, they, they said, okay, we've had all these longitudinal studies that have been going on for 20 some years. What, what can we pull together from all the findings of the literature, of that research, that's important? And there were two directions that were taken. Hawkins uh, began looking at what were the factors that seemed to be related to the onset and initiation of substance use. Um, and then, um, Glance and, and Pickens were beginning, to, were interested in looking at not so much on the initiation, but what were the factors that seemed to be related to uh, moving towards abuse and progressing towards addiction. So those two studies really had a significant influence on our, our prevention at the time and, and still are very important. Um, and I'll just skip through this. It talks about risk and protective factors. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with that. Risk factors, uh, basically, if you look at them, they break out into two general areas, contextual factors as well as the individual and interpersonal factors. And then there's a, a, a lesser uh, literature on protective factors. But with that research, and again, with the research we're getting from the in the neuroscience area, um, we're beginning to understand more about the etiologic processes. If you think about risk and protective factors, they're more indicators of what's going on. But we really want to know what's, what's underneath that. What are the mechanisms involved? And this other research has been very helpful in examining that. And we think, uh, looking at that literature, we, we, we're realizing that we really need to reconceptualize prevention and prevention is, is, is really part of a socialization process. And what does that mean? Well, we know that human infants are born without any culture. Um, so the process of socialization is transferring cult culturally acceptable attitudes, norms, beliefs, and behaviors to respond to such cues in the appropriate manner. So you're all sitting very nicely in this audience, trying not to fall asleep and probably happy to get your break, but you look very attentive and I appreciate that <laughs> at this point. But we all learn in different situations how we're supposed to behave. And socialization is just not a one-time thing. It's, it's a lifelong process. And the individual can be socialized by an array of different socialization ages. Obviously, the most important ones, as we heard earlier, and as we all know from our own experiences, are parents. But teachers, peer groups, uh, religious groups, economic and political organizations, and virtual agents such as mass media have a great influence on our, our, how we view the world and how we interact with our, our environments. 
um, in today, modern societies have become more and more complex, and so the, the likelihood that the socialization process is, is optimal is not always uh, possible. There are so many things going on. There's a lot of neighborhood disorganization. Uh, there's people moving from rural areas to the city for jobs. They're breaking families. They, they don't have the extended family intact, et cetera. Um, then these are, I'm just going to, I've already mentioned these, these are the micro, when we talk about micro level influences, we're talking about those that are more proximal to the individual, and that includes parents and families, peers, schools, faith-based organization. Um, hmm. um, we talk about um, peers, obviously, um, important because in, um, we social, we're socialized by our peers uh, early on, obviously, in our adolescent years, they have a great influence on us. But uh, over the course of our work, our workmates have influenced us. So everybody sort of has opportunities to influence each other's behavior. Also, uh, they mentioned uh, school, et cetera. OK, when we're talking about macro level influences, we're talking about environmental influences. And we're also talking about social and cultural influences. So the, the reconceptualization of prevention then is we can, uh, preventions can target individuals directly through such programs like school-based programs where uh, curriculum where like life skills training where you're actually training, you're socializing children, you're giving them the skills to, uh, pro-social skills to, and pro-social attitudes so that they adapt very nicely into their, into the society. Um, but also uh, we train teachers we train uh, parents to, be, to do their jobs as socialization agents better. The family programs do that well. Uh, and there are other, other kinds of uh, ways of influencing uh, through, with truth prevention programs that we, we actually talk about in, our, um, in the UPC. Um, the UPC is, uh, is not just one group, it's a team. Um, development and training is the Colombo Plan, um, particularly the International Center for Certification and Education of Addiction Professionals. The curriculum development is uh, um, APS, Applied Preventive Sciences Responsibility. I'm coordinating that activity. And of course, funding and management is from the US Department of State. The training goals are, you've heard before, it's really to professionalize uh, prevention specialists. Um, we're aiming to reduce uh, health, social, and economic problems. The emphasis is on evidence-based substance use interventions and policy and builds, uh, it builds on the foundation of the international standards as well as the European Monitoring Center on Drugs and Drugs Addiction, uh, European Drug Prevention Quality Standards. So we draw on the international standards, the monitoring, uh, the European Monitoring Center's document, the standards and knowledge of what science of prevention is from the US Society of Prevention Research. Um, and th that really is the core of it. We have two audiences that we're trying to target. The first audience is prevention coordinators. These we see as people who interface between the policymakers and the public and the prevention practice field. You may, the prevention coordinator may be in the Ministry of Health, might be in the Ministry of Education, it could be in a community um, NGO, um, it could be in a faith-based organization, but somebody that, somebody goes to, policymakers go to uh, when they want to know about prevention. And so th that's what we see, we call them the voice of prevention. Um, the second series, which we're just starting, um, we just finished the UPC1 series. We're, we're, we're actually going to be, we're just starting this year to work on the second series. And this is for the, the implementers, those of you who are on the front line, uh, those who deliver the evidence-based interventions or oversee the implementation of evidence-based policies. And this series is intended to help those people by to apply their understanding of prevention science to the quality delivery of evidence-based prevention programming and we're talking about content structure and delivery strategies um, we want them to uh, participate effectively in the selection of appropriate evidence-based prevention interventions and policies for their target populations 
and to, uh, to also to effectively monitor and evaluate the delivery of intervention policies because we feel monitoring particularly is extremely important to know what you're, what's happening, who you're reaching, uh, what kinds of problems you're running into so that if you have to revise what you're doing that you can, you can, you can do that effectively. Our manuals, we have two manuals, the trainer manual, um, and we have a participant manual. The trainer manual is, uh, is designed for the trainers, so it gives information to trainers about how to prepare for training. It also offers an introduction background on each of the series. And then the modules themselves include knowledge content, exercises, discussions about application in the real world, and a number of resource materials. The participant manual also includes an introduction to uh, each curriculum and uh, it has summaries of, of each module as well as the slides, uh, a detailed summary um, of, the, of, the, of the module, and then citations, etc. cetera. Uh, and as I said, we make these resources available to uh, all of our, our trainees. We use an adult learning approach. I won't go into that much. Um, we have, right now, we have nine curriculum in, in uh, prevention and UPC-1. We have Introduction to Prevention Science, which is five days. We have a three-day uh, curriculum on physiology and pharmacology for prevention professionals. So we, we took a lot of the material from the uh, universal treatment uh, curriculum, tried to adapt it for uh, prevention professionals. And actually, it was we did some pilot testing with uh, trainees in Asia and Africa, and they're the ones who asked to have this as a separate curriculum. So we develop it specifically for them. We have monitoring and evaluation of prevention interventions and policies, which is five days. Uh, Family-based prevention, four days. School-based, six days. Workplace, four days. Environment, three days. Media-based prevention, three days. And then we have a ninth curriculum, which is talking about how do you build an infrastructure to support and sustain evidence-based prevention. Well, as I mentioned, we just finished the pilot trainings uh, of master trainers from Asia and Africa. Um, we're, we completed the pilot training of the first curriculum with the master trainees from Latin America and Caribbean. Um, and on the basis of those trainings, we've revised and, uh, the curriculum. We, the feedback from our trainers, I mean, you all gave us a, a lot of information that we used to make it much more applicable to your circumstances. Um, this is the status for the UPC-1. Um, we're almost done with the revisions. Um, we should be done by November. U UPC-2 series in the development, there'll be eight tracks. Um, the tracks um, will be, um, there's a basic track that will be uh, introduction to prevention science and the physiology and pharmacology uh, for prevention implementers. And this is gonna, everybody will have to take that that track, but then the optional tracks that they can take after that basic course, you can optionally take a, a track on focus on family-based prevention, a school, workplace, environment, as I said, media, uh, community implementation systems, or monitoring and evaluation. Uh, the emphasis on in UPC2 is on knowledge, competencies, and skills. Um, the focus is also on the application of prevention science to prevention intervention and policy implementation. A uh, timetable for, for UPC-1, we hope that we will have, I know people think I'm optimistic, but I'm hoping we'll have uh, some of this material, some of the curriculum ready for pilot testing uh, by February of 2016, um, so we can begin doing pilot testing during the spring and summer. And we were hope we're hopefully we will have uh, revisions done by the end of 2016. Um, again, perhaps I'm optimistic, but that's me. <laughs> um, tomorrow morning, for those of you who are in the prevention, who work at prevention, I'll be talking more about um, the scientific foundation for um, prevention in general, and then um, each of our curriculum developers is going to be talking about the science base for 
uh, their curriculum and talking about what looks like um, it's imminent on the horizon, what new kinds of things are, are coming out that will uh, impact uh, prevention. And, uh, and that's it. Uh, I hope that many of you will be able to attend tomorrow morning's uh, presentation. Thank you very much for your attention.